Thank you for teaching this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is Mishpatim. It is from the book of Exodus, chapters 21 through 24. Last week, we received the Ten Commandments with big, broad stroke ideas about how we're supposed to behave. Do not murder, do not covet, honor your parents, observe the Sabbath. This week's Torah portion gets into the nitty gritty of the commandments. It actually includes a lot of detailed commandments, 53 commandments, in fact. So usually I ask that you look in the uh, Ara Haruta booklet to read texts about the Torah portion. This Torah portion doesn't appear in the booklet, so I'm providing a separate PDF with your email, two pages with Torah gems and values and commandments. You'll read through those and figure out some questions, some personal stories, some reflections that will help guide your conversation with these fourth graders. Okay, so in the Torah portion, like I said, there are a lot of commandments. And just like in the Ten Commandments, it says, do not murder. This week's Torah portion gets more detailed. For example, it says under the commandment section, if two men are fighting and a pregnant woman gets in the middle and is hit or struck during the fight and it causes her to miscarry to for the pregnancy to end, what should you do? Is that considered murder? Is that life for life? How do you, what does the court say about that? So Torah says, the husband shall fine the one responsible. So there's a monetary punishment for causing a miscarriage. But if the pregnant woman dies, then it says life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It's very interesting because a lot of people know that phrase, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but they don't realize that it's in the context of this pregnant woman being pushed down and her pregnancy actually not being considered a life. Um, but the pregnant woman's life is considered a life. There are a lot of other commandments. For example, do not cook a goat in its mother's milk, from which we get the idea of separating milk and meat. You might want to talk with the kids about how they eat. They might keep kosher, they might not keep kosher, but even if they don't keep kosher, they probably have restrictions in their house that they follow, whether it's ethical restrictions, whether it's how much cake they're allowed to have, how many vegetables they're supposed to eat, um, if they're allowed to have sugar right before they go to bed, what are the ways that we keep our bodies healthy? And you could even talk about the purpose of, of separating milk and meat, which a lot of people don't know. One of the spiritual reasons for it is that milk represents life. We drink from our mother's milk in order to sustain life, and meat is death. And when we eat the two together, it's like we're accepting the world in its chaotic form, as opposed to separating them and saying there's a place and a time for everything. The rabbis say that if we are mindful about what we put in our mouths, which is one of the most basic appetites that we have, then we might also be mindful about what comes out of our mouths in terms of how we talk to one another. And hopefully mindful, it will elevate every other aspect of our lives. You could look through all of the mitzvot and you could ask the kids if they seem fair or not fair. So for example, it says, um, if a thief is caught with stolen goods, the thief shall pay double the value of what is stolen. Is that fair? Is that not fair? The commandments also um, have a really interesting one, which I think the kids would find interesting to talk about. If you see the donkey of your enemy collapsing under its burden, you should help, you should help your enemy lift up the donkey. So why does the Torah say that we should, why does the Torah specify that the donkey is an enemy, is the donkey of an enemy? Um, perhaps it's about putting compassion for animals and for others above ourselves, our own grievances and grudges and feuds. Or maybe it's this idea that if you and your enemy do something together, do an act of kindness together, you might become friends. You might actually elevate your relationship, change your relationship, and you might ask them or share an example in your own life of a relationship that was not good, a troublesome relationship that was somehow transformed into a very healthy, good relationship. And maybe they have relationships, maybe they have frenemies, maybe they have people they don't trust. And what can we do to change that? The Torah portion also talks about not taking a bribe. And I have an example of a story here of a widow who cries in the courtroom and how tears can also be a bribe. A bribe doesn't always have to be money, but tears can influence and you know, stir up our pity, and that can also be a form of bribing. So you can look at all of the mitzvot. You can look at um, these. Uh, there's 
also a, a verse that says, I'm sending an angel before you to guard you. And you might ask the kids if they believe in angels and name Jewish angels. There are a lot of angels in Judaism, actually, from the angels Shalom Aleichem that we welcome in song on Shabbat to protect us, the angels guarding the Garden of Eden, the angels going up and down the ladder in Jacob's dream. Um, there are angels all around us protecting us. But yet we don't talk about angels that much in Judaism. So maybe who are angels in their own lives? I also included under values this concept of pursuing peace. What are ways that we can pursue peace? And there's a famous uh, thing in the a, a famous uh, saying in the Talmud, which talks about how every argument for the sake of heaven is has lasting value, but every argument that is not for the sake of heaven doesn't. So what's the difference between a good argument and a hurtful argument. And perhaps a good argument is one where both sides are concerned about the community, the well-being of others. And a bad argument might be one where both sides are really just interested in themselves. And perhaps you can think of examples um, and share examples of what those things are. The Torah provides the example of Hillel and Shammai as a good argument and uh, Korach as a bad argument. So th that's a little bit of diving into Parsha Mishpatim. Really looking forward to learning with you, and I know the children are as well. Thank you so much.